Hello, it's me, Kristen, and I'm here today for my own solo panel. And if you're watching right now, I'm super happy you're here, and I'll do my best to make this interesting for you. So today, we'll be talking about what I do for my day job, which, if you can guess by this lovely title and these little hands here, involve hands. So today we'll be talking about an occupational view on hand therapy. Um, when I'm with ASA, I'm the health and wellness executive. And when I'm at my day job, I am an occupational therapist or OT for short. So unless you're an OT yourself or you've had occupational therapy, or maybe you have a friend or a relative who's an OT, uh, chances are you don't really know what OT is or you have a vague idea. So I'm just gonna get on a little soapbox to begin with and just kind of explain OT. So when I first meet patients, I introduce myself as an OT and either people will censor the occupational word out of their head and just think I'm a physiotherapist or they just ask me if I'm gonna help them find a job. Uh, the amount of times I've been referred to as a physio by patients or even colleagues is too much. Um, I'll literally introduce myself as an OT and then I'll be halfway through my session with a, a patient. They'll get a phone call, they'll pick up the phone and they'll say, hey, I'm with physio right now, can I call you back? And then I just can't help, I just look at them a little differently. Uh, and then I have to choose whether or not I correct them or not. And if I do, it goes into the same old script with this generic and boring and they forget it and I hate explaining it. And it's terrible, but I just stop explaining and I stop correcting people um, and then I just accept it. I'm a physio now. Um, but my hope is today that if I can explain it one time now to a broader audience, it may save me just a few more explanations in the future. So what is OT? It's a type of healthcare that helps people problem solve through barriers that interfere with their ability to do their occupations. So occupations is not limited to just jobs. Uh, occupations really refers to any kind of activity you do through your daily life. Uh, so usually it's broken down to three subheadings. Occupation. It can be self-care. So anything you do to kind of take care of yourself, uh, keep yourself alive and clean. So things like showering, getting dressed, eating, etc. Then we have uh, leisure. So whatever you do for fun. And then productivity, so things like like your job or volunteering or school. So these are three very general and broad categories. Uh, you can imagine that any one occupation isn't limited to one category. There's lots of overlap. So for example, uh, I do draw, I do art. Um, primarily, it is a leisure activity. It's just a hobby I do on my side, I do for fun. Uh, but sometimes I do take commissions and then it turns into a productivity kind of thing. And then sometimes uh, it's self-care because I do it for my own mental health when I'm feeling in a slump and I need to get the angst out. I draw sad drawings that no one will ever see. Uh, so then in that way, it can be all three. So this rosy description of OT is that we help people participate in their meaningful activities. So I use this OT lens as a way to guide my approach to my role within ASA. So how can I enable people to participate in their meaningful activities? In this case, gaming and participating socially in our community. So a useful framework that I use to guide my practice and my volunteering time with ASA as well um, is what we call the Canadian Model of Occupational Performance and Engagement. It's called the CMOP-E. That's what I call it. I usually don't remember what it stands for, but in the middle, we have this lovely triangle, which represents the person themselves. And that person is broken down to three different categories. So a person is made up of their physical self, their cognitive self, and their affect, which is their feelings. And smack dab in the middle is their spirituality, which doesn't necessarily have to mean religion. It's just whatever is meaningful to you. And then surrounding that person is their occupation. So whatever kind of activities that you're doing, right? So again, it's either leisure, productivity, or self-care. And within the whole context of that person, we have their environment. Um, and their environment can be different uh, kinds of environment. It can be like an institutional environment, cultural, uh, their physical environment, uh, or their social environment. So OT, 
uh, is a very holistic practice. It kind of takes a look at the whole person, their different components, uh, different things that they do in their day, and then their whole environment. And then you can tackle problem solving uh, by taking a look at any of these components. Like, does a person need an adaptation in their environment? Or do they need a change in themselves? Or can they change what they're doing in a way to, to help their engagement in, in whatever they want to do? So the moral of the story is that OT is very much its own unique profession. Although there are lots of similarities to physio, depending on what field you're in. In hand therapy, there are lots of similarities. Um, but if you meet an OT in your life, make them happy and call them an OT. So we're going to be talking about hands now. Again, I'm an OT working in hands and the plastic surgery outpatients clinic um, in Edmonton. And the main topic I want to talk about today, hands. Most people have them. They're really useful for doing things. And they're really important. Uh, you, usually what's talked about in hands in this kind of uh, setting in the gaming sphere are those repetitive strain injuries um, that make up the most of the issues in this community, right? Like lots of button mashing and repetitive movements, thumb problems, wrist problems, etc. cetera. Uh, today, I won't be talking about those kinds of injuries because I don't feel like it. I don't feel like telling people to stretch their hands and to take breaks because they do that every day, uh, but not today. I can keep doing that tomorrow. But today, I want to be talking about what I see and deal with at my job, which are mostly acute traumatic injuries. Uh, for example, since COVID started, we've been seeing a sharp increase in the amount of table saw injuries. Uh, everyone's doing home renovations to keep themselves from going stir crazy, uh, which results in lots of injuries. Um, we see lots of People trying to fish out knives from sinks and then slicing their hand open. Uh, we see lots of people with fractures in their hand from punching walls or other people. Uh, what I, a thing that I like about my job is that I get to ask people, how did you get this injury? And then hear them awkwardly try to explain that they got really drunk and they got on a lime scooter and went for a rip and fell off and jammed their hand in a tree. Really fun. Uh, but another common trend I see is that uh, people grossly underestimate their hand. There's a lot of people who are surprised at how hard it is to regain their range of motion, their strength, their dexterity, their function, uh, how much time and effort it can take for just a tiny finger, it's a tiny pinky, maybe it's just their thumb. They're just surprised by, damn, this is complex. Um, the hand itself and our brain's connection to our hands are crazy complicated. Uh, the depth is nuts. And even then, like things are still being discovered and research is still coming out that challenges our previous health conceptions. Um, so yeah, take this as a disclosure and warning that I don't know everything for sure. I can't go everything in one sitting and this presentation could potentially not age very well. Like it could be disproven in the future quite easily. Things could, there's lots that can change. Um, so how important are hands? So I have a visual representation. Ta-da! So this is called the brain, the sensory motor homunculus. So these represents a map of our brain areas dedicated to either motor or sensory processing of different body parts. So the relative size of each body area in these drawings represents the relative amount of brain space dedicated to that body area. Uh, the motor cortex on this right here is responsible for planning, controlling, and executing voluntary movements. And the sensory cortex on the left is responsible for sensation, so identifying touch, pressure, temperature, etc. As you can see, um, proportional wise, our hands are quite large. They take up a, a good amount of space in our brain. So we have lots of control of our hands as, as witnessed by this, right? Uh, we have lots of fine movements and lots of dexterity in our hands. We use our hands a lot. We use them all the time, every day for almost everything. Uh, so it makes sense that it makes up this huge part in our hand. And our hands are also really sensitive. Like you could, I could po poke you in two places in your
our hands are really sensitive, so I could poke you in two different areas in your hand that are really close together, and you could you could tell them apart. You could tell that they were different, as opposed to other parts in your in your body. If I poked you in the same uh, difference in distance, then you probably couldn't tell that I poked you in two different places. Um, so changes in these brain representations can can happen really quickly in direct response to how we use our muscles. Um, there is cortical competition, right? The more we use one thing or the other, the more representation it gets. And therapy can improve the proportional cortical representation. You, you can imagine that after you injure yourself and you're forced to be immobilized uh, for a certain amount of time, um, whether in a cast or a splint, those represent these representations will change. So even it takes even nine days uh, for the brain to kind of change and diminish the size of this to diminish uh, with immobilization. So yeah, hands are really important as as shown by our our brain. So we're going to be going over some different kinds of injuries. So today I'm just going to go over fractures and tendon injuries super briefly. Um, starting with fractures, they're the more simple kind of injury. Um, if you were ever to choose one between a broken bone or a, a tendon sprain or a tendon injury, uh, go with the fracture because that takes a lot shorter to heal and it's a lot less complicated, this whole course. So this is a bone. It's anatomically accurate. Um, there's different kinds of fractures. So we start with, if it's just a clean cut this way, transverse fracture, oblique fracture. Um, if uh, the fragments start to get broken up like this, I always mess this up, Co comminuated fracture, it's probably butchered. Um, we see this a lot with crush injuries um, where the, just the bone fragments are, have chipped everywhere, then that's that's a more annoying type of fracture, right? So uh, the fragments aren't uh, in place, they're kind of flown off. And then when that happens, when we have different fragments like this, oftentimes conservative treatment isn't enough. So conservative management would just be splinting. Like if your bones were, were well aligned, they had a fracture like this, but it was still anatomically like well aligned, then maybe just splinting you could get away with. But when you have something like this, then usually surgeons will have to reduce it uh, using some kind of hardware. So pins, plates, screws, things like that, they can put in your, in your bone. Um, oftentimes people will just have pins to keep the, the fragments in place. Um, and then the pins will just be sticking out of your skin. It's it's quite interesting. You'll just have things going right through, uh, and then people just have to protect those pins or keep them clean to prevent any kind of infection. Um, but yeah, different kinds of techniques for in terms of surgical management and therapeutic management. Uh, if the general timeline timeline is that we immobilize that fracture, keep it safe for about four weeks. You're continuously wearing the splint and then at about four weeks if things are well aligned and things are healing well then we can start you on active exercises so active being using your own muscle and brain to move your hand it's just less strain on the hand at six weeks we can start pushing on things um, a little bit more force and pressure but again by six weeks enough healing should have uh, occurred to start that we always check with x-rays before we kind of move on to the next step to make sure things are safe um, and then around seven to eight weeks, we start strengthening at about beyond that, like week 10, you're, you're pretty much good to go and you're returning to full sports and heavy duties. Um, if the surgeon is able to reduce this fracture, probably not this kind of fracture, uh, with internal hardware, so usually like a plate and screws in place, um, which does not come out, then we can we can fast forward that whole protocol by two weeks. So we're immobilizing you for two weeks. Uh, at the two week mark, we're starting active movement. At four weeks, we're starting to push on things. We're starting strengthening way earlier. And that's all very good for therapeutic outcomes. So 
anytime we can do an early active uh, range of motion protocol, uh, therapeutic um, outcomes, your range of motion, dexterity, everything is usually much better. And like, why does this occur? It's because movement has lots of benefits. So movement maintains that lubrication uh, within the collagen cell matrix in our hand, which is necessary for motion. And movement prevents abnormal cross-linking uh, between collagen. So collagen uh, is a type of tissue that usually our tendons are made up of and everything like that. Uh, they kind of look like this. They're kind of parallel, but then they do have some cross-links which makes things stronger, which is, gives it its tensile strength and its elasticity and things like that. Uh, when we have injury, sometimes, or not sometimes, it does happen that there's just too much cross-linking that occurs. And when that gets out of hand, that leads to stiffness. It's not as flexible anymore. So early active motion, like our tissues are so sensitive to stress and motion, uh, the structural organization of collagen fibers is much more superior uh, when early gentle stress is applied. So movement prevents that this, this overabundance of cross-linking to occur, um, and this movement orients new collagen fibers to resist stress. So, and again, if we go back to that homunculus, if, if we can start moving early, then we lose less of that representation in our brain and we prevent uh, maladapt maladaptive patterns of movement from occurring. So uh, we'll go through a little case study. Um, if we have a hand, all right, so this is my drawing of a hand. You would think I'd be better at this, but I, I actually hate hands. If you go through all my drawings, uh, you'll see that I, I try to avoid drawing hands as much as I can because I'm a scrub. Uh, but this is a hand and it's gone through, it has a fracture. So these are the little bones in the hand. Boop, boop, boop. Then we have our long bones here. I'm just gonna ignore the thumb, and then we have all of our, our carpal bones. It's a, it's a mess in there, okay. So let's say that we fractured this bone here. That's what we call a boxer's fracture, because when you punch something or you punch someone, this is the bone that's likely to get fractured. So general splinting principles when it comes to, to fractures is that we always protect the joint that's above and below it. Uh, we don't want things jostling around there too much because it needs, to, again, needs to be immobilized for enough bony healing to occur. If there's too much movement, then bones won't unionize as well. Uh, callus is, is not forming between the cracks. So uh, what that kind of looks like is that we need to immobilize the wrist and then that this big knuckle here is what we call your MCP joint. So when we do immobilize the MCP joint, uh, a general rule for that joint too is that we don't splint it into straight like this. Uh, our big joints have collateral ligaments on either side of it. So if we zoomed in and this is the joint um, and this is our, our hand muscle here, we've got collateral ligaments on either side of it um, that stabilize the joint. And if we were to splint you straight like this, they're super tight they're tight in this position. Um, if we were to bend the joint, that big knuckle like this, so it's going more towards this way, then those collateral ligaments are more stretched out. So when we get you out of the splint after four weeks, you're not super stiff in those big joints. Those come a little quicker for sure. If we were to splint you like a board, like straight, and we got you out after four weeks, it would literally be like this, like eek, 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 like you wouldn't be able to move it. You'd be a board. Uh, so it's really important that whenever you, well, not whenever, but as a general rule, uh, when you include the MCP joint, that big joint in a splint, it, it's bent like this, again, to preserve uh, the collateral ligaments and to make sure things stay kind of loosey-goosey in there. So uh, what does this splint look like? If we problem solve through it, Again, I'm going to draw my 
So I'm going to draw my hand from a different angle. Her thumb, her index finger, and our middle finger don't have to be included because they were not injured. So if we can take a joint or a finger out of a splint, then we won't immobilize it. Because again, immobilizing it means stiffness. Uh, and then we want to keep things moving as much as we can. So, but again, if we have, um, usually when we have a fifth finger that's fractured, then we, we'll buddy it to the, to the finger next to it. So these two will be splinted together, even though this finger isn't injured uh, just for, the, for protection of this finger, then we'll, we'll put them together. So we have big knuckles bent at these two fingers right here. Move that up. And then a splint will literally come up here. We'll cover that big joint, keep it in bent. And it'll go two two thirds way, the way down the forearm. So it's holding those big knuckles in a slightly bent position. It's keeping the two tip joints free, so those are free to move and bend as you as you will. And then it's keeping the wrist immobilized in a neutral position, so straight. And that prevents that that I mean that protects this fracture here. We call this a ulnar gutter splint. If the fracture was a little bit higher, if it was up here, boop, 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 then we would have to extend it upwards. So usually we cover the whole thing. Technically, you could leave the tip free, but this, like this, isn't isn't much anyways. Um, and then. It does, we don't have to cover the, the forearm. It could just be hand-based. It could just come like this, and then your wrist is free. That kind of makes sense. You just always protect the joint above and below it. So that's fractures, fractures 101. Um, and now we'll move on to flexor tendons. So flexor tendons we see a lot as well. Um, and it's usually a, a, a big priority for us. So we like to see, we see people like a few days after their surgery. Um, and then again, flexor tendons take a long time to heal. We give it three months. Um, and then usually after that three months, it doesn't mean they're off the hook. They're coming off, they're coming after usually because they've got like residual stiffness or weakness or contractures in their hand that we need to resolve. So this is a hand. Again, I'll draw my own hand. It's pretty, this is a pretty bad, okay, yeah. Ugly hand, but it's okay. You get the idea. Okay. Okay, this is a hand, and then we divide the hand up into different zones. So for flexor tendons, it's different for, for, for flexors versus extensors, but for flexor tendons, like the tip would be zone one, and then from in between here, to the distal, distal palmar crease, so this line in your palm uh, would be zone two, and then zone three would be the palm, and then your carpals or your wrist would be the fourth, and then onwards would be zone five. And then the thumb has its own thing, but we won't be, we won't get into it, um, but it has its own zones as well. So depending on where the laceration is, it, it'll affect uh, what kind of structures are involved and like what it means for therapy. So we have two different flexor tendons that run along our hand. Uh, we have our FDP, flexor digitorium profundus, which, ex which attached to the very tip. It bends this one here. Uh, and we also have flexor digitorium superf superficialis, so FDS, that attaches to the middle one. It, it helps bend the middle joint here. So if you have just a cut of the FDP, Likely this will be intact. You could probably do this, but you couldn't bend that tip. Um, if you had a cut of FDS, the ones that attach the middle, uh, likely you'll still be able to make a full fist. FDP, so the profundus one that attaches the tip, is usually enough to bend everything together. So, which makes the FDS tendon, the one that attaches the middle, a good candidate for um, 
transplants if we if we ever need. So flexor tendons are a lot different. If you had a cut to just one finger, we can't just splint that one finger. Your whole hand needs to be splinted um, because they all share a common muscle belly. Um, so activating one will affect the other. So you need to put everything in. It, it's, this, it's this bulky thing um, and there's just no way around it. So again, when we're splinting uh, for flexor tendons, if it's your whole hand and the MCPs are involved, the big knuckles, you have to make sure that they stay bent so it doesn't get super stiff. That's one reason. The second reason is because if your flexor tendons were repaired, you can imagine that having your wrist forward and like your, your hands bent would put the tendons uh, the most in lax. So when, we, when they have the repair, they want to make sure that things are kind of cinched up so that they have the opportunity to heal. You can imagine that if I had my hand straight and my wrist back and I was splinted like this, this would put the flexor tendon that runs along the front of your hand that helps us bend, it would make it in the most amount of tension, which we don't want because things could just fall apart and rupture again. Uh, after you have a flexor tendon uh, repair, things are super fragile in there. Again, we, we give it three months to heal. Not saying that you'll be immobilized for the whole three months, but for a good chunk of it, you're immobilized and we're telling you exactly what you can or can't do week to week. Things change uh, and progress like that. So um, because, again, the muscle belly is in the forearm, it is a forearm-based splint. So it comes down your arm two two thirds of the way down and we're covering all the way back up here. It's called a dorsal block splint. If I were to draw my hand again, the thumb is its own thing, so it doesn't have to be included. But then boop, boop, and boop. And that's what it usually looks like. This is your hand. This is your hand in the splint. That's a little better. OK. The splint comes along the back. It's not including that. Oh, I should do this on a different layer. Okay, and then it's literally a block on the back of your hand. It's like a big half an oven mitt. And that's what it looks like. It's holding your big joints bent and it's keeping your IPs, so the, your tip joints straight. Your wrist can be neutral. This is enough, depending on the repair. So it depends on the strength of the repair how long you waited from your injury to get surgery uh, because the longer you wait the the further your tendon recedes so then the further they have to fish out and then if it's long enough they may need a transplant like we talked about earlier um, which again it's its own rabbit hole um, but yeah keeping it like this is it's when it's protected and then you're wearing this all the time you're wearing it at night you're wearing it during the daytime you're wearing it to showers you're, you're wearing it for everything um, the tendon is super fragile, so you're not going to be using your hand for anything anytime soon. Um, all you're doing are exercises in a very specific, safe uh, protocol. So for flexor tendons, this is when early active range of motion protocols are absolutely key. Um, if you were, if for any reason the repair wasn't strong enough, or again, like patient compliance, if we don't trust that the patient is going to do what we say and they're just going to go and do whatever and rupture their, their repair anyways, then you go with a conservative protocol, which has you immobilized for a lot longer and you're not doing as much movement. Um, and then you end up with a really stiff hand. It's really hard to rehab. Um, if we can start moving things early in a very safe way again, then you'll have a lot better outcomes. So again, it's the collagen, right? It's the, it's the main component of connective tissue and it holds things together. It's mostly found in tendons, ligaments, and skin. Um, and its tensile strength is greater than steel. Uh, so when again, when we have injury, uh, it's that disorganized collagen, which is, uh, which is coming up and this leads to stiffness. Um, injury to mobilization, cross-linked collagen, and limited stress from just being immobilized, it, it triggers all that collagen cross-linking, which leads to stiffness. Um, so if we can start moving things earlier, um, then again, all that movement is very beneficial from preventing that stiffness. Um, another thing to consider is scar. Like usually, 
usually when you have a traumatic tendon laceration, um, it's a lot, your hand has gone through so much. So it's been, it's the initial cut and then they have to open you up to do surgery and then they have to close you up again. It's, it's very traumatic for your hand. Uh, lots of scar is going to form. So scar is good because it's what's holding your, your tendon together. After you have a laceration like that, it's no longer tendon connecting to tendon. It's scar that's the glue that's holding those two ends together. So if you're really scarred down, then we're less worried that you're going to rupture and that things are going to stay intact. But also lots of scar means lots of stickiness. So like scar is basically glue. It it just sticks to everything everywhere around it. When that happens, the structures underneath aren't gliding the way that they're supposed to be gliding. Um, when we have too much scar, it can stick the tendon down to the bone. And when that happens, things aren't are stuck. They're not going to move. Like I could push on your finger and you could you could be like I could make a full fist by pushing on it. But then if I ask you to do it yourself, then you just you'd be like like this because your tendons aren't gliding and they aren't they aren't they're connected, but they're not they're not gliding. It's that shortening and that lengthening that allows us to to move our hand. Um, so early motion, allowing us to like in a very controlled way to move our hand early will prevent those adhesions from happening and will will have good glide of our tendons um, to prevent scar. There's other ways to to prevent scar as well or to manage scar. So like massage is a really good idea once the stitches come out and the wounds close, um, just to break up that that excess scar and make sure that things don't stay firm and lumpy and bumpy. We want scar to be like soft and flat and smooth and etc. So massage is really good for that. There's other things, but that is one of the most effective things you can do. Uh, and then there's other things to, to consider like wound and swelling and edema and lag and contractures and all that stuff. There's a lot to consider when it comes to a hand, um, but that's basically the gist of it. Um, and then just to end off this uh, presentation, I just want to bring it back to OT and function. Um, measuring range of motion and strength is uh, our very objective measures that we take all the time. We take it throughout the, the progress of the, the process um, to gauge like how are they progressing and how are you doing? Are you where you need to be, etc. Uh, everyone likes the numbers, um, seeing them go up, like range of motion, uh, strength, seeing that, seeing all that stuff go up objectively is, is a very like motivating thing. It can make you super happy. Um, but also if they go down or if they stagnate, which it will eventually, um, it makes people really sad. <laughs> so um, having a shift in perspective to function uh, can bring more satisfaction to, to progress and it's what matters at the end of the day. Um, when it comes to hand therapy, it can get really technical and like we are really concentrated on like getting that extra, those extra few degrees and, extra, and et cetera. But we shouldn't lose sight of that this person, we're doing all this so the person can use their hand. When I first meet a patient, I'll always ask them like, what do you do for work? What do you do for fun? Like, what do you need your hand for? Uh, and that way we can collaboratively build goals that way. So. If someone's working a desk job or they're, they're playing video games or like, and that's what makes up the majority of their day, am I going to be working on getting them like a hundred pound grip strength? Like, no, it's not a useful use of our time. So really it's getting like what they prioritize and then implementing that somehow in your, in your, uh, your whole process to get what they need. Um, and then there's the working on remediation and then adaptation. And usually it's the combination of both approaches that will get the person satisfied with whatever progress or end goal that you have. And so in conclusion, uh, protect your hands, take care of your hands. They're really important and it'd be inconvenient to, to damage them in any way and lose whatever functionality they have now. Like we really do take our hands for granted. They help us do so much. Like keep them safe. Uh, take knives out of sinks very carefully. Uh, and don't punch anyone. Uh, and yeah, hands are super complex. If you have any questions or you want to know more about OT or hands, like feel free to DM me. Um, I'll talk about 
like hands to anyone. I really love hands. I, I love my job. It's really cool. It's it's a mix between like science and art and creativity and style and personality and a, a way to express yourself. It's awesome. And I get to pick scabs. I get paid to pick scabs. And that's one of my favorite parts as well. But thank you so much for tuning in and learning about hands with me. Um, and as I learn more, I'm sure to share more as I go as well. Thank you so much.